Now to the history of journalism. I think it's important to learn this history to realize that journalism is not a forever thing. It was invented and developed. It's not sacred. That is to say that there's nothing to stop you from reinventing journalism as it progresses into the future. So I'm going to do this as quickly and as painlessly as I can, but I hope you'll find it as fascinating as I do. It's important to begin by noting that the history I'm about to give you is dominated by Western white men. That is one of the reasons to learn this history, to understand that foundation and what needs to be fixed around what we do. Now, I'll acknowledge first that movable type and printing were invented in China and Korea. They didn't spread from there for a number of reasons, most likely because the languages were complex and because government used it more than private industry. Our story really begins then in around 1440s, 1450s, in the city of Mainz in Germany with Johannes Gutenberg, who invented movable type. But what did he really invent? It wasn't so much the press, though the press was adapted, but presses had been used to squeeze grapes and olives and bind books and press napkins and make paper and lots of things. What Gutenberg had to invent was a way to make letters, to make fonts out of metal so they could be used again and again. He had to make thousands of them to make the Bible. And to do that quickly, we think he invented, he's the one who invented, a handheld mold into which they put a mold for a letter that had been engraved out, and into that was poured a mix of lead, antimony, and tin. This was a special mixture of metals that would cool very quickly so the letters could be made very quickly, and so they could be turned off basically what became the first assembly line with speed and scale. So in this sense, Johannes Gutenberg was a geek and an inventor and a technology entrepreneur. He also had to deal with problems of chemistry and creating ink that could stay on the paper. Uh, and, 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 and if you go to see a Gutenberg Bible, there's one at the New York Public Library. I recommend doing it. You will be impressed with the midnight blackness of this ink even to this day. Gutenberg also had to solve financial problems. To make the book, he had to find paper and space and build the presses and buy metal and make the types all before any money came in. So he found someone to fund his work named Johann Fust. At the end of this entire process, as the Bible was finally coming off the press, ready for sale, Fust called the loan, and Gutenberg lost much of his business. We think now it's because it was part of the deal originally. But Gutenberg kept on printing, and Fust kept on printing with his son-in-law, Peter Schoeffer. And they printed lots of different things. Around that time, there was a war among bishops for control of Mainz because it was a very powerful city. And Schoeffer and Fust printed things for both sides of the battle. That is to say that the technology didn't take a side. It was used for good or bad, depending upon your side. They also, like Gutenberg, printed indulgences, which were used by the church to raise money, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. It's important to see, too, that People see the future in the analog of the past. So when Gutenberg invented printing, he made the fonts look like scribal handwriting because he wanted to replicate the beauty of scribal books. It was called originally automated handwriting. Look how we see the internet today. We see it in the analog of the past. We still talk about books, magazines, and newspapers online. We haven't really begun to rethink and reinvent what the internet could bring us and do us do to us. So, with that war in mind, some printers left, uh, Gutenberg included for a while, and some fled to other places, and thus printing spread. People who had learned printing under these three pioneers took it first to Italy, then up through Germany, into France, into the Netherlands, also over to England. It then came to the Americas, first going to Mexico City about 100 years before it arrived in North America. I find it really interesting that from 1450-ish until 1800, the technology fundamentally didn't change. What changed was how this invention was used. 
And so we had Montaigne inventing essays, the form that you'll learn when you come to uh, opinion writing. We had Cervantes and others creating new forms of the novel and fiction. We saw scientists use print to finally be able to share information quickly with some consistency. And so you had fascinating collaborative projects where people had scouts, journalists of a sense, bringing them samples of plants and pictures of animals drawn from other exotic places to share together. You also had a desire to categorize the world and store all knowledge. So you had the growth of encyclopedias and also then eventually dictionaries. And dictionaries began to formalize language so that many dialects would become one form. And it also formalized the nation of one person, one people versus another people. It helped lead, I believe, to the notion and substantiation of nations. Now, this was a wonderful invention, but not everybody loved it. There was, as there always is with new technologies, a moral panic that ensued, a worry about what it was going to do to us. There was a Venetian scribe in the 1470s named Filippo de Strada who complained that printed books were crammed with the foolishness of common folk. He appealed to the authorities of Venice to essentially control, if not stop, printing. I'm going to read to you for a moment his impassioned uh, poem that he wrote to the Doge of Venice. They shamelessly print at a negligible price material which may, alas, inflame impressionable youths, while a true writer, a scribe, dies of hunger. Cure, if you will, the plague which is doing away with the laws of all decency and curb the printers. They basely flood the market with anything suggestive of sexuality, and they print the stuff at such a low price that anyone and everyone procures it for himself in abundance. And so it happens that asses go to school. The printers guzzle wine and swamped in excess bray and scoff. He was complaining about a lot there. He was complaining about his own field of being a scribe and a friar being challenged. He was complaining about the market for expensive books being ripped away. He was complaining about immigrants, Germans, coming in, he alleges getting drunk and brain and scoffing with all their money and taking away his business and ruining the minds of youth. It sounds familiar. English poet Alexander Pope said that print, in print, the bard and the blockhead march side by side. So all of this sounds familiar. What we're seeing is that whenever a new technology enters into the world that enables speech from people who didn't use the prior means, and voices unheard can finally be heard, the gatekeepers who controlled the old media cry out in fear and try to control it. We see this occurring again and again in history, and we certainly see it happening today. Now, on the other hand, of course, many loved print. Martin Luther, on the other hand, called print the ultimate gift of God and the greatest one. He, of course, used print to publish his theses against indulgences in 1517. In the 1520s, he and Erasmus became the first best-selling authors. And this led to the Reformation. And I find it really interesting that in the early days of print, Luther, who was in the church, Erasmus, who was out of the church, used print as a means of dialogue, of conversation. We'll come back to that idea later. But print really was not just a mechanism of printing something permanent for everyone to read. It was a way to enter into a discussion. Now, with the Reformation and eventually the Thirty Years' War and all kinds of struggle, came more calls to control print, and fairly early on. The first known call for press censorship was in 1470. A century later, the Catholic Church would create the Index of Forbidden Books. It lasted from 1559 until 1966, and in all those years, it created a hell of a lot of bestsellers because people wanted to read what was forbidden. The earliest print martyr in England was James Bainham. In 1532, he was arrested and put on the rack by Sir Thomas More because he had printed books by Luther and others. He was burned at the stake. In 1579, two printers lost their right hands for publishing attacks on the Queen's possible marriage, one of them was the unfortunately named John Snubb. 
Now, there's a furious debate today about what we're calling cancel culture. Who has the right to speak? Who has the right to edit and choose? What is appropriate to be said and what is inappropriate to be said? What's really happening now, I think, is that after almost 600 years of control by print and the Gutenberg age, society is relearning how to hold a conversation with itself. We'll come back to this idea later. So now let's come to the next major invention with print, news. In the early days of print, there was news. It took many forms, proclamations, official announcements, bureaucracy, forms that people could fill out to do their business and spread around. There were also sermons that became printed, placards posted on walls. There were a lot of news pamphlets that tended to cover one event, a, a battle, a crime. There were poetry, ballads, broadsheets, and songs. There was a, an industry of news singers who would come into a town, itinerant travelers, and sing the song and then sell the printed versions of it so that people could take it and paste it on the wall of their home or the pub. And there they could sing it together. So news became performative, a community act. Now, print was not all good. It helped spread moral panic around witches, around crimes, around bigotry of all sorts. At the same time that it spread the work of the church and reformation. Print could be used for good and bad. News in this time, as we would consider news, came to a great extent in the mail. There were correspondents called avisi, uh, an Italian word, uh, who compiled reports from each other and from their sources. And they would compile this in a newsletter and sell it at a high price to the privileged in power uh, in both government and the church and business because that was valuable information to have. You wanted to know what was coming onto the boats in Venice to London so you could deal with the price of pepper. And this required that postal routes had to be established. That was another development around the same time. The emperor uh, uh, and, and other monarchs established postal routes, which enabled the news to travel among the VC and enabled them to sell their newsletters in turn. But I want to emphasize, this was news for the privileged. It was news behind a paywall. Again, that sounds familiar. We see how things now aren't working in some business models, and the reflex is to say, we're going to sell this. But who do you sell it to? People who can afford it. Do we want journalism to be the product of the privileged? It could be happening again. So a VC were spreading news to those folks until about 1605 and long after. But in 1605, an Avisi seller in Strasbourg named Johann Carolus bought a printing press because he thought it'd be a great idea rather than having to laboriously handwrite a dozen or two newsletters that he would sell, now he could print a couple hundred. He asked the city of Strasbourg for a monopoly. They didn't give it to him. Nonetheless, he went into business and he survived for about 50 years. This was not a eureka moment. I think I'll invent a newspaper. It was instead an evolution of prior forms. It was taking advantage of what existed for a market, for a community, for needs. It's important to know that the newspaper at this stage was really boring. It was just a recitation of the reports that came from other AVC. And the promise was made by Corollas and others that they would not edit or amend those in any way. They would just put them in. There were no headlines to make it easier to read. There was no news judgment to decide the priority. It just laid us in, just went into the press. And there was no addition of any explanation because the people who read these were presumed to be in the know. They know who so-and-so bishop was going into such and such a town and why that mattered. The Strasbourg relation lasted about 50 years, which is pretty amazing for the first in its field. But many of the copycats that came right after failed. There wasn't a business model at the beginning. Newspapers at first, you should also know, did not cover local news. And the reason was because local news was risky. The prince or the bishop could jail you or cut off your hand or burn you at the stake if you pissed them off. So you tended to cover things that came from outside your area. Uh, and so newspapers tried to present the world to a town. 
but this too was met with efforts to control. In France, for generations, there was only one newspaper, the official newspaper, the Gazette. I want to read you briefly a report that it made on Cardinal Richelieu. His eminence's unequaled eloquence and the perfect knowledge he has of his material made this discourse so easy for him that he spoke for nearly an hour, during which time one had never seen such attention, the eyes of the entire assembly fixed upon him, their ears upon every word and their bodies immobile. These were certain signs, as their unanimous applause was, so far from any suspicion of flattery, it was their state of rapture which made him so able to gain the hearts of the entire audience. Which sounds like what Donald Trump expects of Fox News and often gets, and from the rest of media. The first newspaper in the U.S. came in Boston in 1690. It lasted one issue, and the authorities shut it down. Our most famous proprietor of newspapers in the U.S. in this period was, of course, Benjamin Franklin. And note well that he was not only the publisher of a newspaper, he was also the official printer of Pennsylvania, and he was the postmaster. Interesting little side story. An earlier postmaster also had a newspaper. Franklin decided to compete with him, so that earlier postmaster decided that he wasn't going to distribute Franklin's newspaper. That earlier postmaster had pissed off the postmaster general, who fired him and gave the job to Franklin and then ordered Franklin not to distribute the paper of the other guy. This is what happens when you work too closely with government. You lie down with dogs. You get up with fleas. We've been figuring out the kind of conflict of interest we have to deal with from the various earliest days. Now, there were hardly any very small bits of diversity in this story of news in the beginning in the U.S. There were women who became printers in Europe and the US, but mainly when they inherited their presses from their dead husbands. Franklin, as well as Noah Webster, the creator of Webster's Dictionary, also brought the idea of magazines to the US, and that in turn led to people to start magazines for women as a marketplace. But it was often produced by men. Frederick Douglass, of course, published the North Star, important newspaper in the history of African American uh, journalism from 1847 to 1851. Then he started publishing what he called Frederick Douglass's paper from 1851 to 1860 and the New National Era from 1870 to 1874. I recommend the book by Frederick Douglass, book about Frederick Douglass, uh, called Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom by David Blight, if you want to learn more. And you also read in Lewis Raven Wallace's book the stories of T. Thomas Fortune and Ida B. Wells. These are critically important stories to the beginning of media, but it is also important to realize how little attention and power they got. It is hard to study them because much of the newspapers that were printed then were not saved in libraries. Uh, black newspapers became an important alternative for people not served in white mass media, and that is, sadly, still the case today as mainstream media newsletter, uh, newsrooms lack diversity and lack the lived experience of more people. So I want to mention that this is an important view from our own school. We have the Center for Community Media, headed by the wonderful Graciela Moszkowski, who has run a uh, summit and also a study of Latinx media in the U.S., and she has just brought on Aaron Foley to head a black media initiative. And Aaron's going to start by looking at the African-American newspapers that are still being published and to try to help them succeed. And we'll also be looking at new publications. So when I say I want you to reinvent journalism, I don't just want you to change the form. I don't just want you to change how things operate in an existing newsroom. I want you to start newsrooms. I want you to start new properties and new enterprises to know how to serve communities that have not been well served. I mean, consider how long newsrooms have been asked to uh, diversify their newsrooms and and they won't even today report the numbers about how many people are there, let alone handing over power. So we need to consider the power in journalism, not only at the level of staffing, but also at the level of management and also at the level of ownership. All right, so let's go back in our history again to the time of the beginning of newspapers. So we go from Gutenberg about 1450-ish, 1454, 55, the Bible comes out. We go to the first newspaper in 1605. Get that, a century and a half. 150 years before anyone ended up inventing what we now think is so self-evident, the newspaper. 
we now advance from 1605 to 1710. That's when printing really got its business model. With the passage of the Statute of Anne, which was the first major copyright law uh, passed in, in England. And with this copyright law came the metaphor for information that we work by and think by still today. The idea that a publication is property, a product, a container, content, something to sell. That's a fairly modern idea. And again, it's not a forever idea. And copyright too was a mechanism of control. It said who is allowed to print things and who is not. Governments also issued licenses and monopolies to allow certain people to print and others not. Now importantly, around this time also, especially in Amsterdam, there came the invention of advertising in newspapers. Primarily at first with book publishers who were also newspaper publishers promoting their own books, but it expanded to anybody pretty, op pretty quickly. Um, we'll talk more about advertising when we get to the business section of our talks, but obviously it became a critical support for journalism more so later. And now we go from 1450 to 1605 to 1710, we hit 1800. And this is the first time when we really got a lot of technological innovation in printing, which amazes me how long it took. There was in 1800 the invention of the iron press. Until this time, the press was a hulking, wooden, creaking beast. And by making it iron, it had more control over being able to print a little bit faster. There was also the invention of a, a process called stereotyping. I find it fascinating that after Gutenberg created movable type, every single letter was one little piece of metal. And the compositor, who had to put together the type, pulled in one letter at a time laboriously, letter by letter, word by word, line by line, column by column. And then having printed it, somebody had to take all that type and put it back in every single spot in the type case. This is how it was done from 1450 until 1800. It was incredibly laborious. and There was no way to save that effort. If you had a really popular book and you wanted to print another edition, you had to set it again. Stereotyping was a method invented to mold a finished page so that you could in turn mold duplicates of it and print from those. And that way you could save those plates and print again and again and again as more orders came in. It changed the economics of printing. And then interestingly, the biggest innovation to come to printing in all this time came in 1814 or thereabouts with steam power. Steam powered allowed the press to get faster. And, and, I, and it came first to the news business at the Times of London. The owner there secretly bought two presses. They put them in a building next to the paper. In the Times office, he told the printers one night to hold tight because there was big news coming from Europe, so don't set the paper yet. We'll get to it quickly. Just, just stay all night. Meanwhile, in the new building, he printed the entire run of the Times. And then he brought it over and showed it to the printers and showed them basically they were screwed. The history of labor relations in our business isn't so great. Interestingly, to fast forward for just a moment, the same newspaper, the Times of London, was eventually bought, as you know, by Rupert Murdoch, who um, decided to change the entire industry because it was too expensive for him to have too many uh, union-run uh, presses and, and typesetters. And so he secretly built an entirely new facility in Wapping, the District of London, and then one day just moved everything over there. It led to a huge strike, but the striker is basically lost. So the Times of London has been an odd uh, place for both innovations and labor disruption over the years. But the important thing about steam is it led to scale. And scale led you to make more and more and more papers. And at first it was made by still pressing, then it, then it was the invention of the rotary press, so you could turn it around. And then came continuous rolls of paper in 1804, so you weren't slowed down by putting new sheets in. And then you could really print lots of papers. And this reduced the cost of printing. It increased the scale, also reduced the cost of printing. So we ended up with the penny press, the newspaper for a penny. And this is the first time that printing became available to what we're going to call briefly the masses. It was the beginning of mass media. It was the beginning of the idea of the mass.
This is an important element in, in the history of media entirely. I think this is the moment when we lost the conversational element of printing, that Martin Luther would talk with Erasmus in, in a disputation back and forth, or Erasmus would talk with his friend Sir Thomas More by writing books that referenced each other. They were trying to recapture the conversation that had existed before print, and they held on to it for some time. But once this became a matter of scale, then suddenly we had to convince, we in the newspaper business, had to convince the public that our one-size-fits-all product was perfect for everybody. You all have to buy this. It's going to serve all your needs. And so that became a different way to look at society. Now, another important innovation around this time, around the 1840s, was the first uh, use of wood pulp to make paper. Before this, paper was made primarily from linen and cotton rags. And there were shortages of rags. Rags became terribly valuable. Publishers and printers would put out ads to the ladies, sorry, of the house, begging them to save all their rags and sell them. Governments would declare that rags were a strategic asset and couldn't be exported because they were so valuable to making paper. But then along came a process to tear apart wood, bleach it, and uh, uh, pull it into its cellulose fiber so that it could be made into paper. And that, in turn, again, reduced the cost of printing immensely, increased the volume, and we have the real mass market. Finally, the last major uh, new innovation in printing itself came in 1886 with the invention of the linotype. The linotype took away the process of having to put in print one letter at a time. Instead, it would bring down molds for a great, wonderful machine. It's a, it's a magnificent machine. Uh, there's a video I can send you if you're interested of the last day of the linotype of the New York Times. It's a great Rube Goldberg clack of the clack of the machine that held in the molds for letters in these big magazines. And the printer would press the letter A, the mold would come into place. Plus the letter B, the B would come into place. It would go into a line. When the line was complete, the spaces would spread out to justify the line to make it fit so it all fits the same, same width then that line gets carried over to a part of the machine where lead is poured in to make a line of type, thus the name, a linotype. And that line would fall down one after another after another into a galley of type that became a story, that became a page. And this is how, finally, the laborious tasks of compositing text and then redistributing text and molding what was in essence a stereotype became possible in one machine. It was revolutionary. Now, the next big innovation in our field in media was the telegraph. It had huge impact, of course, on news. Remember how the Avisi worked in networks. They would compile each other's work. That was the precedent. It wasn't considered plagiarism then, though beware, listen to the laws about plagiarism and, and, and there are norms about plagiarism now. But there was a lot of copying that occurred. Um, in the early days of newspapers in the US, the US Postal Service uh, enabled newspaper publishers to send one free copy of their newspaper to every other publisher. And they would exchange newspapers in this way and thus exchange news. So now comes the telegraph. And that enables the exchange of news on an entirely new level. In a sense, it began to erase distance and time. Neil Postman, who's a brilliant uh, professor, uh, the late Neil Postman at NYU, said that within months of Morris's first public demonstration of the telegraph, the local and the timeless lost their central position in newspapers. So now, remember, the newspapers started where they didn't do anything local because it would get you in trouble. And then as newspapers spread across the world and across the US, and you were in isolated places, they became local institutions. They reported local news. That was their primary job. But now the Telegraph could tell you what in, in, in New York or in Schenectady what was happening in London or in Berlin. And you could include that fairly instantly in your report. That changed our way to think of what news was. When the first transatlantic cable was laid in 1858, jubilation ensued. The New York Times reported, and I quote, New York yesterday went cable mad. Church bells rang for an hour. The factory bells and steam whistles of the workshops joined in the general tolling and shrieking. People drank in the glorious tidings of success. 
the uh, wire soon broke and didn't work again for years, but nonetheless, the precedent was set. And once again, new technology, along with it comes complaint. A Washington correspondent for the New, the New York Times wrote this. Has the land telegraph done any good? Has it banished any evil, mitigated any sorrow? So far as the influence of the newspaper upon the mind and morals of the people is concerned, there can be no rational doubt that the telegraph has caused vast injury. Superficial, sudden, unsifted, too fast for the truth must be all telegraphic intelligence. Does it render the popular mind too fast for the truth? Ten days bring us the mails from Europe. What need is there for scraps of news in ten minutes? Now, I don't want to get in trouble with those of you who uh, majored in history, and I don't want to argue that history repeats itself. But there are lessons to be learned from prior transitions into technology. And once again, we see a parallel. The idea that the news, there's too much news, that it occurs too quickly, that we're too stupid to be able to take it in, that we really don't need this, that it really isn't curing anything, which is the paper tiger itself, that was the introduction of the telegraph. Now, I've left out a significant part of the history of media, and Andy Mendelson, who is our associate dean, who did his PhD in this field, and John Smock, who teaches photography here, would yell at me at this moment and be raising their hands in the back of the room, where we all in the room, and say, Jeff, don't forget about images. They're right. From the very beginning, print was not just about text, but also about illustrations of places, of events, portraits, representations of plants and animals and maps. Various technologies, from wood prints to etchings in the early 16th century to lithography, improved the quality. And so this became also an age of visualization. And imagine what happens to people when they can see what things elsewhere look like. Right? What creates a public? Jürgen Habermas, the sociologist, argued that the public came through coffee houses and salons in the 17th, 18th century. But some researchers uh, led by a group out of McGill University in, in uh, Montreal a few years ago said that publics were created also by the book because people gathered around an idea. They were created around the theater as 3,000 people would come into the Globe Theater to listen to a play, watch a play about Richard II and start to think together about what it meant to have an incompetent ruler. I'll leave that there. Um, but also importantly, images. Portraiture said, aha, that's what they look like as opposed to what we look like. And it created in us and them. Maps said, this is where I am, that is there, this is here. And so images are really important to our our imagination of what media brought to society. And then, of course, in technology innovation came photography. And Kodak released its first camera in 1888, and thus the camera became smaller and released from the confines of a studio. In 1901, the New York Times wrote about the impact of photography on news publishing with a couple examples I find fascinating. When Lincoln was shot, Harper's Weekly sent all its artists to Washington by train as quickly as they could to draw the scene and rush back, drawing them and then having them engraved. It took four days for Harper's to come out with a special edition. With the Telegraph, the Times said, illustrators would go to the scene, draw a scene, and then wire back a description of their illustration for another illustrator in New York to recreate the illustration by description and then have it engraved and printed. When President McKinley was shot in Buffalo in 1901, photographers there got their images back to Collier's Weekly in 14 hours. And illustrators were soon largely unemployed. So, in our history now, 1650, 16, uh, 50, uh, sorry, 1450, 1605, 1710, 1800, now we're at 1900, the beginning of the 20th century and the first wireless transmission, radio. After the, the telegraph, wireless telegraph, radio and voice became the real first competitor to print. And print resented this intrusion and attempted protectionism. Newspaper publishers forced an agreement called the Biltmore Agreement that limited radio to just reading the news that they were forced to buy from the wire services that the newspapers fed. They forbade the uh, NBC and CBS, the first two networks, 
from making any money with advertising on news. They demanded, get this, that commentators would talk only about things that happened more than 12 hours ago because the newspapers said they owned news. It didn't work as an agreement because newspaper publishers also owned radio stations and didn't like this. The wire services didn't like this. It went away. But the newspaper publishers were not done being jerks. Here's a neat twist. The publishers insisted that radio should be regulated by government. And then they said that no medium controlled by government should be allowed to report on government. Thus, radio reporters should not be allowed into the press panel in Congress. Okay, we figured that out. We got along with each other. We leaped forward to the 50s in television. And then a lot of newspapers died. We ended up with more monopolies in cities. Let's review one more time the timeline of media. 1450, up thereabouts, pretty begins, 1650, first newspaper, 1710, copyright and a business model and a way to look at this as property, 1814, steam in the mass market, 1900, wireless transmission leading to radio, 1950s, television, and here we are now at 2020. What did I leave out? Of course, the net. October 1994 was when the first commercial browser came out that really popularized the net as the web and enable anyone to get stuff there. That's about a little more than 25 years ago. So go back on this timeline. 25 years after 1450 and the invention of print is 1475. In Gutenberg time, that's where we are. We have a long stretch, I believe, ahead of us. Again, I'm not saying that history repeats itself, but I am saying that the creation of a technology and its influence and impact on society and how it gets used and reinvented and how it enables other inventions takes time. People talk about how we're going under a very fast timetable now and change is happening so quickly. I don't believe that. I think change is actually happening slowly, which is to say we've just begun, which is again to say you have plenty of time to reinvent journalism, to rethink what it is. When I've gone through this timetable in the past, I've said that we're at 1475 in Gutenberg years. And then I say that Martin Luther wasn't born until 1483 and he didn't start the, the theses, publication of theses until 1517 and, and so on. And so I say, perhaps our Martin Luther isn't born yet. Well, lately I've come to see that perhaps our Martin Luthers have been born. Perhaps it's the creators of Black Lives Matter as our equivalent people who used a new technology as Luther did to expose corruption and inequity in society and bring their voices and new voices to fight that and organize a new world. Is this our reformation? One last thing. I want to talk to you about a concept called the Gutenberg parenthesis. There are three academics from the University of Southern Denmark named Tom Pettit, Lars Ole Sauerberg, and Marianne Borch who came up with this notion of the parenthesis. Let me explain it to you. They say that before printing, information was passed along mouth to mouth, family to friend, traveler to, to town. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was part of conversation. It was changed along the way. Knowledge and memory were collective and collaborative as people performed in verse and, and sagas, the memory of their culture. There was little sense of ownership or authorship of all of this. It was just passed along. Uh, books did have a business model, but it was pretty simple. One scribe, one book, one patron, almost a year. And the scribe's mission was to preserve the knowledge of the ancients, the belief of the humanists that we had to bring back the lost knowledge of the ancients over, over the Dark Ages. So this is what happened as we enter into the Gutenberg parenthesis. Now we arrive inside the parenthesis. And with the book, knowledge becomes bound by covers. It has a beginning and an end. And our cognition of the world becomes linear. As Marshall McLuhan would say, the line, and this sentence is an example, became our organizing principle. We expected everything to be a narrative with, again, an alpha and an omega and a neatly tied up end. Text became unchangeable, preserved, permanent, authoritative. They became identical and consistent, so they weren't subject to edits and changes by scribes along the way. <clears throat> Thus, text gained authority. Here was the definitive version. And we no longer honored the ancients. We now honored the author of the book. Frau, doctor, professor, so-and-so wrote a book because she's an expert. We honored expertise. Institutions were challenged by print. 
popes and princes. They tried to control it. And institutions were reborn. There were the new ideas, as I mentioned earlier, of the nation. The idea of education changed, and thus childhood itself changed. Now, rather than the scholar having to go literally to the books that existed from the scribes, the books could come to the scholar. Now every student could read a book and learn on their own. Now we, we believe we reached silent reading. Reading became private, and we had a sense of privacy in society more. We also had a sense of the public gathering around the ideas in books. And obviously, we reformed religion. It took a few centuries. But publishing eventually found its business model. And then writing and text and creativity, again, were seen as products and property, a commodity we call content. But I don't much like that. Content is something that fills a product called a book. So society no longer conversed so much as we consumed. And now, say these scholars, we are coming to the other side of the parenthesis. Now comes the internet and the closing of the parenthesis. And they're not saying that we are going into a new dark ages or that what just came was the dark ages, though that's a choice of ours. Um, we learn everything we've learned already. We bring this together. But they say that we have the opportunity to look back. If we look back and compare to today, we see that once again, knowledge is passed around freely, link by link, click by click. It's remixed and remade along the way. It's, it's, it's flexible. It's no longer fixed. The value of owner, ownership and authorship is diminished. Thus, we're finding ourselves in rancorous debates about copyright. We no longer communicate just in text and just in photos, but also in moving images and modern ideograms, memes, and emoji. Our memories are not trapped on pages, but they're held in a cognitive cloud where we can search for anything. Our cognition of the world is no longer also trapped, but becomes a constellation of clicks and links, memes and emojis, search and social data and algorithms, abrupting into what we have now, which is an epistemological warfare where we don't really understand where authority lies because the institutions that established it are being challenged. And we don't honor the ancients. And unfortunately, less and less are we honoring the experts. Look at the people who won't wear masks. Instead, philosopher David Weinberger says the smartest person in the room is the room itself. That is to say, the network that connects everyone in their knowledge. Our institutions are challenged, and it's no, by no means certain how media, journalism, education, privacy, policing, authority, the law, the public, the nation will emerge. And so I sat down with Tom Pettit, and I said, wow, what a coincidence. Today looks a lot like yesterday. And he said, no, you idiot. That's why we call it a parenthesis. That Gutenberg text, that entire history, was an exception in the history of society. And again, he's not saying that we eliminate what came in the parenthesis. No, we, that's all there. It will stay there. We learn that. Books aren't going to die. Uh, newspaper print might die because it's not a very good business anymore. But, but our lessons of that world are there. But the point is that we can now restore the view of conversation, the view of collaboration, the view of community we had before Gutenberg changed our way to see the world. And it is in that context that you can reinvent journalism because you can look at what values you want to restore, how you want to rebuild the world, knowing everything that came before. And so when you arrive in journalism school, I think you're arriving at a fulcrum of history. And the next time in our videos, we're going to talk about the mission and the impact of media and journalism in society and what is journalism and what is your role. And then again, we're going to talk about the business of journalism. And then finally, we'll talk and then you'll build. Thanks for your kind attention.